Hello everyone, I planned to give a speech at the beginning, but time is against us and I'd like our two distinguished guests to be the main ones to speak and to share their impressions with you, each from their own angle. They all both have strategic thinking and for years I have admired the ways of thinking and that's why I wanted to just say as an opening, that the challenge in this discussion, we talk a lot about military insight, we talk about Iran, things that we're very strong in, mostly in ways of grappling with them, but there are many things that impact Israel's general situation, and that's the tension I wanted to talk about. For instance, national resilience. Let's say that national resilience would break down. Will the IDF, will the Mossad be the ones to address it? Slowly but surely, we are becoming a single state, a one state for two nations, and it doesn't interest anyone. It seems to be just happening, as if it's happening somewhere in the North Pole, but it's happening here and now. The PA, the Palestinian Authority, has been described as a group of terrorists. I remember when I was in the IDF. Um, I wanted to get rid of Arafat because I thought he was an arch enemy and arch terrorist. And now Abu Mazen, maybe he's not a member of the Zionist mo movement and he probably won't be ever, but at least we can have security coordination with him, with the IDF, with the ILS, and so on. ISA, and, and so on, the Shabak, and so on. So there's a list of challenges, like Jordan, which we sometimes uh, seem to be speaking of as if they are enemies of the state, but they are saving us both blood and money. And the IDF does not really need to defend. It's not how much we defend the border, but how much we don't need to defend the border. So there is a series of challenges, a series of issues, and I would like to dedicate this dialogue or this conversation to the strategic issues and ask where are we headed? Where is Israel headed? Not only in areas where we're strong, including the last review that is um, about how the IDF's capabilities and how it what it can uh, work with, but those it cannot. Gadi Eisenkot, former chief of the IDF general staff. Good afternoon, Tamir is with all the jazz and all the summer dress and now uh, going to, uh, they're going to be against me in Golani, but we didn't We are entering Israel's 75th year, a country that from its inception has been in crises, has been coping with various threats, and now a days when we look at the challenges that are posed, I always want to talk about modesty. We need to understand that there is a gap between what we see what is overt and what is covert, what are the security challenges of Israel, where sometimes on the agenda there is a certain threat, there is a, a lot of challenges that are all being coped with together, and they all bring about a certain policy. At the same time, there is a basic flaw in Israeli society, and that is the fact that Israel does not and never had a formal un unified defense strategy and Israel's national security policy is impacted. I don't like it, but I can understand it from a reality that is political of what we can and cannot do. And when I try to map out the challenges, the security national security challenges, as Amos said at the opening, I would position as the first challenge, the form, on, with its first and foremost, and that is Israel's national resilience. And only then would I rank the Iranian threat, which is a severe threat in their pursuit of nuclear, as well as their pursuit of regional hegemony in Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Yemen, and also their ability to produce advanced missiles and UAVs. Third, I would rank the Palestinian arena, and here the the name of the game of managing a conflict is for many years leading to a game which just means not taking initiative, not doing anything, and responding to events because we want to improve the here and now instead of looking 
five, ten, fifteen years down the line. And Amos mentioned the risk of the one state, the single state, the binational state, and I think that when we look at the statistics between the sea and the river, between Jordan and the Mediterranean, there are more Arabs than Jews. And I think that this trend of managing conflict is leading us ultimately to the reality that we are experiencing today, whereby Hamas, a terror organization, which we cannot mistake for anything else, they have a vision, they want a religious uh, battle, only then a national one. We see how it conducts itself in recent years, how it is managing to actually um, bring together the Israeli Arabs, Temple Mount, West Bank, uh, and even uh, pose a threat uh, from Lebanon. And it's a, a built a model that is working for it. It's a successful model. They are trying to keep the Gaza Strip quiet. It is like the hand that rocks the cradle and creates a kind of overall direction, and not of the actual attacks that took place, but many that have been thwarted. And it is very difficult to um, deal with these uh, focal points. And they also realize that when they work with East Jerusalem and with the Israeli Arabs, they're actually neutralizing their greatest enemy, which is the IDF. The IDF is not able to be active in uh, East Jerusalem or among Israeli Arabs, and that's what they're focusing on. In the West Bank, they realize their capabilities. And fourth, I would rank the northern arena and the threat posed by Hezbollah. It is a threat that should not be seen as uh, one that is small. It is not. It can definitely uh, challenge Israel's supremacy, uh, but it is met with a security policy, and that is the full half of the glass. It brings Israel's supremacy in terms of intelligence, in terms of technology. We have many accomplishments, many achievements. We are able to curb Iranian nuclear. Um, we are able to curb Iranian entrenchment and various other steps that are improving Israel's national security alongside the great risks that we are facing. Tamir, just briefly, as the former head of the Mossad, all of your uh, missions were well known, and but uh, following what Gadi uh, just said, I want to ask you two questions. Every so often, you used to present, also in discussions, if you want to explain that, that other priorities, you would say Iran, the IDF know what to do, but there are many other things. First of all, how do you rank later on your set of priorities? And if you can explain how is it that there is no interface between the different systems in Israel and a national security strategy or policy. I think that Ben Gurion with his 18 principles was the last time that we discussed that. And it wasn't yesterday, it was way back in history. And even those in the room weren't even, you know, ab about to be born uh, when he was talking about those 18 principles. So if you could share with us your thoughts on the subject, because I'm so worried that it's just getting worse. There is a kind of disconnection. Now, when you set out on a campaign, the IDF writes recommendations for policymakers and then it comes down as direction. So how would you explain that procedurally, the lack of a strategy? For instance, in Jerusalem, following what um, Eisenkot said, um, Salawar is sitting there. He is no strategy expert, but he has a comprehensive overall strategy because he wants Israel and, and Jerusalem mainly to be up in flames. And we're talking about the terrorists, and we're talking about Gaza. But what is your set of priorities? What is the kind of set of priorities that you always advance, and how would you explain this connection that is becoming deeper and deeper between the political echelon that should be in charge of strategy and those who carry it out, and who are the only ones who are carrying out the strategy, but they each have their own. Good afternoon. That was quite complex, your question. I'll try to answer at least part of the challenge that you've posed for me. I was in eighth grade when the Six Day War broke out. We learned in geography lesson, we talked about, we, we got blind maps and we, of the city of Israel. And we had to first of all draw the border because what's a country in its most simplest definition? It is a group of people with a single aim that has territorial definition. Since then, since June 10th, 1967, there is an entity, unique, 
the only one in the world that has not defined its territory, and it hasn't defined its own territory. There are countries that define territory, and neighbors and, or other countries do not acknowledge their borders. This has happened along throughout history. But a country that does not define its own borders, its own territory, that is a rare, unique incident that has been happening in the last 55 years. Israeli government, since Geula Cohen on the right-hand side of the map until Shulamit and Shulamit Eloni on the left side of the map, have all lived through this illogical reality to this day. Most Israeli governments who were around the central left, right or right side of the map, the political map, um, were accepted this problem. I think it is the biggest problem Israel has between, between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, and the Jordan Red and the Sea. There are more Arabs than Jews. And if anyone had dreamt that a miracle would happen and one morning suddenly things will be reversed, the tables will turn, well, they're dreaming. And that reminds me of an interesting meeting I had when I was uh, almost uh, done being head of the Mossad, one of the regional leaders, and he opened this issue up and he said, we Muslims, have a dream that one morning we'll wake up and be no, there won't be a single Jew between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. And he waited for my reaction and then he continued and said, and you Jews have exactly the same dream but in reverse, that one morning you'll wake up and between the sea and the Jordan River there won't be a single Muslim. And then he said, we Muslims have understood that it's just a dream, and it'll never happen. And the reason why we're willing to accept the existence of the Zionist state here is because we have realized that your might, your capabilities, your power, and your contribution to the Middle East, this crazy area, is huge, and we do not have the ability to make this dream come true. But where are you? What do you want? What do you Jews want? What kind of state would you like your grandchildren to live in? Do you want a single state, one state, that as I have said, you are no longer a majority in? Or do you want to find another kind of arrangement, another kind of solution? Because it is clear that no one will be leaving. And if they do leave, it will only be those who have a lot of money and can immigrate elsewhere. And then you'll be left with an even bigger problem. That is the number one problem that Israel has. That for the last 55 years it has chosen not to manage or not to have this conversation. Since Golda Meir's time, for a long time, there was nothing here except Jews. That's what she used to say. Yes, exactly. And to this day, when we tell ourselves a story that nobody cares, so this policy or this strategy or this national security view of Israel, unfortunately, is rooted deep within the Jewish DNA, unfortunately, which means that once we are persecuted, once we have enemies, the Jewish DNA looked and said, well, we'll wait for this to pass. That's the solution. And so a democratic state, or any state for that matter, if it does not take its future into its own hands, then the question of what's going to be, what's going to happen here in 30 years' time to our grandchildren, and some of us here already have great-grandchildren, well, we don't Israel have an answer to that question. Lita? Israel has she not yet decided that it wants to have this conversation. We could decide just to have a single state. Because it's inconceivable that over the years, there will be anyone who will be willing to live with no rights in the territory in which they are living. That's inconceivable. It's impossible. Such events make empires collapse. 
חוסר ההבנה וחוסר הרצון להתמודד עם הסוגיה. שאנחנו רוצים בין הים לבין הירדן מדינה אחת. יש לזה משמעויות. לגבי חלק זה סוף החלום הציוני. לגבי חלק זה הגשמת האידאל של חזרה לארץ אבות בין ויכוח על כך שבתלחם וחברון זה ארץ אבות. אבל מה לעשות? ולחשוב שמישהו יברח מפה, אז ראינו, אז ראינו, ומהלכים שנעשים, או נעשו לפני עשרות, לא מתקיימים. אז כדאי שננסה לחשוב היטב ולעורר את השיח. גם בתקשורת, גם בכנסת, וגם בכל סלון, מה אנחנו רוצים. האם אנחנו רוצים מדינה יהודית דמוקרטית, בה יש לנו רוב מוצק, שהיום בגבולות הקו הירוק הוא עומד על סדר גודל של 75 אחוז? או אנחנו רוצים מדינה מסוג אחר, שבה אנחנו נהיה מיעוט. תודה. גדי, שמעתי הרבה פעמים, וגם פרסמת מסמכים, ואתה עוסק בזה המון. שוב, אני רוצה לציין למען הרקורד, בקיצור, כמה הערכות אסטרטגיות שהופרחו בשנים האחרונות, ואני אענה אסטרטגיה. נכבוש את ביירות, בירה של מדינה שלא קיימת, ונשנה את המציאות. We talked about maybe occupying Beirut, and then what happened, the biggest achievement is, was the withdrawal from Lebanon. As for Arafat, I also mentioned him, now we have the Palestinians, what Tamir described in Gadi before him, and I think we must again uh, explain the importance of Jordan, that some are thinking that we can topple, there is already fire that is kind of, uh, e- you know, eating away at the uh, United States, and I'm worried that we We will not have the support of the United States in the future. Can you share with us vis-a-vis these two changes? Because what they say, as long as there's terrorism, there's no one to talk to. And if there is no terrorism, we don't need to talk to them. So that also corresponds with the assumption that the Arab states, mostly the rich ones, are... Um, having a, a, a dialogue with us, even though we don't have any talks with the Palestinians. So can you share with us the overall strategy that you have been engaging in for so many years? What are the guiding principles that you would recommend be adopted and embraced as a strategy? I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow morning, but let's say a miracle happened and it would happen. You mentioned Beirut in 82, and based on the previous lecture that talked about the lessons that we can learn from Ukraine, I think that one of the main lessons, from my perspective, is the reality of leadership. The way that the Russians imagined the logic of their rivals, and they defined the objective of war that, that and, their, and how they perceived their capabilities, how they perceived the national spirit that would stand behind, that would back them. And these are things that are important for us as Israel and the strong countries like our friends in the United States, in Afghanistan and Iraq, and I don't want to go further back than that. We, the attempt to Re- to reach a, a conclusion and to change reality. And this reality has to be very clear when we, when we exercise force in order to improve our national, to strengthen our national interests. Next week soon will be the 100th year anniversary of the Iron Wall written by Jabotinsky and 50 years since the death of the first, Israel's first Prime Minister. Ben Gurion, that'll be next year, 2023. And this gives us something to think about, about how to move forward. When we look back 74 years ago, we can look at the incredible state that was established in a very complex and problematic situation with an ongoing battle. Uh, Since then, we've constantly battled terrorism and fought seven wars 
and our goals are clarified along the way. When we talk about the security goals, we know we talk about deterrence and defense and, and, def and decisive victory. I would also add at this stage the concept of, of influence as a fifth concept that reflects the desire for good um, for, for, good, par for good partnerships, good relations with our neighbors. And I think that we face enormous challenges here that the state of Israel is coping with preventing the Iranian nuclear weapons and stability and building up its forces and also the Palestinian the Palestinian uh, conflict that the IDF deals with on a daily basis and the borders we spent a lot of time invested a lot of resources on our borders with Syria and Egypt what we have to do is to deformulate a vision that begins with Israeli society, which I think is the beginning, is the basis for a new contract of solidarity. And we have to be very concerned by the lack of governance in the Galilean and the Negev and the ability to tear down an illegal settlement in Chomesh. I think that this is problematic and it prevents the state from being able to manage our city many different things, as we saw during the pandemic. We have to create a new identity that is based on the Declaration of Independence as a defining document, and its first, te first sentence defines the fundamental values of a national home for the Jewish people, the Book of Books, and the and official uh, nationalism. And I think that these principles are what made this state possible, and I think it's even more necessary now when there is lack of mutual responsibility. Only 40 percent of the 18-year-olds in Israel are jo join the army. I think this makes it very clear, and this is a very troubling statistic. When I look back at the day that I was recruited in 78, in, among men was 88 percent who were recruited. When my youngest son was recruited in July 2015, it was 48 percent, and that's where it stands now. What happens if we continue? the numbers continue to drop in the next 10 years? Our army is our insurance policy. Policy. We have built a very an incredible force, incredible power in Israel. I don't want to brag, but I think that the force that we have built up here enables the state of Israel to tell itself that it is invincible by any military force that is that is aimed at Israel. We have the te we have techno technological power, human power, scientific power, and what we need is a new strategy and a new vision for the state of Israel. At, at, with, at the, with the basis of a new social contract between all member, all sectors in the small Israeli society, better, more identification with the state. And if I may say a brief, speak briefly about the lack of governance, just last night they tried to pass a law Called from uniform to studies to find to fund studies to find fund studies for released soldiers and this law is not passed because of different con conflicts between the coalition and the opposition. I think it we think we should be ashamed of that. I think that reflects how far how how far we've deteriorated and the lack of our ability to work together. The things that were said here that have been talked about since this morning and things that are most said and Tamir during this session, those are the, those are the main points. The, this is the time for decisions, to take initiative. I think the decisions that have been made over the years regarding the Iranians, these were courageous decisions, they were the right decisions to make. We have responsibility for the world and for ourselves to prevent Iran from having nuclear capabilities, which could have, been possible, could have happened if Israel hadn't taken action. I think that our operational and intelligence capabilities are incredible. They disrupt terror and allow Israel to make decisions from a point, a position of power and advantage, and not with the paradox that when blood is being shed, it's not the time to make decisions, and when things are comfortable and easy, then why make decisions? That's the paradox. But we have to think about how to advance Israel's national interests, which have to be defined, and to take initiative and to make decisions that will benefit the state of Israel and not benefit 
that if it's political survivability or that will look good on the evening news. For many years, Israel lived in a region that did not interest the world at all, other than very specific points at times of war when the superpowers did not want to prevent the defeat of the Arab countries. We worked relatively freely in the, in, whether in Lebanon or during the Six-Day War and during the Yom Kippur War after we changed the direction and IDF began to fight back and con take control over territories that it hadn't had access to before. The world is changing and we're not realizing that. The fact that for the past decade, if not longer, the the, the, butterfly, but the, the, the butterfly wings that fly in one area affect the other side of the world. And we're not realizing that in Israel. That's not influencing our decision making. The events in, U in Ukraine will have an impact on how we act. The, development, the, the developments in the Democratic Party in the United States over the past years are related to Israeli policy, but they're also related to evolution in the United States, even in the United States, what used to be the majority is gradually becoming a minority. We see this all over the world. And in one of my in meetings, a, world, a leader of a country that has many more, a much, much larger population in Israel and even larger than the United States, he said that in order to cause chaos in a country, all you need is a few hundred people, not, not, not more than that. And even a country that has hundreds of millions can become chaotic if it loses the power of governance and loses the ability to control and to rule, and this is seen in the streets as well. What is happening in this, what has been happening in the state of Israel in the past years, as someone who will soon be 70 years old, I never uh, could have imagined that I would see something like what happened this week at the funeral of a hero, of a soldier, age 47 who was brought to rest after the who was laid to rest after the event in Jenin that a family member said that eulogy will not be given if a minister of the government of Israel is present at the funeral. Over the years, the state of Israel, things like this never happened before. In my opinion, this is a problem. It is not a problem, the problem of a mourning family. This is a problem for all of society, for all of us, for all of us who live in this country. And we see this because we are transparent, because the world is transparent today. Nothing is done behind the scenes. And Developments like these are visible. If Nasrallah one talked about the spider web speech, talking about the rationale that what happened during the destruction of the Second Temple was that we con had a significant contribution to the fact that the that the Jewish kingdom collapsed, let us be careful, we must be cautious. $51,000 GDP will not place, the 17th place in the world is not what is going to help. That is not a guarantee for resilience. We have to keep that in mind. I would personally be happy to continue talking to you for the next week, I, but the, the clock is ticking, it has, the, the clock is the only thing with the strategy and never stops. I'd like to ask as follows, there are headlines just from the last few days about the Secretary of the Teachers Association saying that soon there won't be teachers 
The interns soon will stop, will refuse to work. Governance is being lost in the Negev and in, in the Galilee. On the other hand, you read about uh, an MK who has these plans and those plans, and this is an important part of, of what the Prime Minister spends time with. I'm intentionally not mentioning any, mentioning every name because I'm talking in general terms. I want to ask you, is there a chance that the P that this nation, that is a genius nation, will, ad will adopt strategic thought patterns or, as both of you <laughs> talked about, if we don't make these changes now, if you don't make decisions, that's also a decision. There's no such thing as not making a decision. Failing to make, an a, uh, make a decision is equivalent to making a decision. And I'm not even talking about the legal system that we heard about before, that all has all these cr many creative ideas. We had here the former uh, Supreme Justice, and if, so we, we do have to make decisions. We can't sit back and not make decisions. Is there any way of changing that with the existing method of governance? Where can changes be made? Because if changes aren't made, then we will encounter all the phenomena that was mentioned, that has been mentioned. The, the question is not what the people want, it's what the people need. And that goes back to the leadership. And the leadership must speak truthfully and present a strategy and give hope. And that goes back to the political level and the manner in which you have to convince and present an ideology and not obscure boundary uh, opinions or ideology because it may be unpopular. I think that this takes us back to the Israeli leadership, even though convincing can be done in writing or with statements in education and in many other ways. But it's definitely the responsibility of the Israeli leadership to give hope and to speak truthfully. I think that's the direction we have to take. It was very sad if there, was, when, if there wouldn't be any hope in this situation. I think that it's top down and bottom up at the same time. Our demand of our leadership must be to look us in the eye and make plans, I would like to know what the state of Israel thinks that the number of doctors should, in, should be in 15 years from now in Israel, to develop a plan and to implement it. Teachers, psychologists, pharmacologists, pharmacists, and so many others, I can give you numbers for each one of them, plans, multi-year plans, Governments will change, which is perfectly fine, but strategies can't change like the wind on the last weekend that went from east to west one minute and west to east the next minute. It's impossible to, to operate like that. It's impossible that any time a director general enters a ministry, develops new strategic plans, and invents hundreds of millions of shekels in it. Israel is a rich country. That is from the top-down perspective. Bottom-up, the media, and all of us have to demand that the public servants Meet their, fulfill their responsibilities. And their responsibility is not to make headlines in the evening news. It is what will happen here in 20, 30, and 40 years. Because what we do now and the seeds that we plant now are what our grandchildren and great grandchildren will eat years from now. And if we don't plant seeds, if we don't plant tree trees, then that will be our end. I after a few years after the intelligence assessment, I'm glad that it was the goal of the uh, other side. The things that were said here were very difficult, uh, very important, but hard to hear. And this is overall, you're talking about, you said that we need leadership and we need a strategy. Our anthem is Hatikva. 
which means hope, and we have no choice. This is the message that I would like to relay in all of the lectures that we hear today, and that's why this conversation was very important. Each of you pre presented it from your own perspective and from your own involve involvement in the very important uh, events that you were involved in, but there is obviously no alternative to leadership that defines strategy than lead the country, because otherwise it's just a group of, it's just a bunch of initiatives. If there are groups, there are sectors, then those sectors are strong. But if we don't address all of the issues of the tribes and the governance and health care and education, then it's like a tree with damaged roots or termites that eat the home from the inside. And the, the connection between national resilience and national security is very clear. Thank you very much, Lieutenant General Gadi Eisenkot and Tamir.